agree. <laughs> it is so scary. <laughs> to tell my students I was like look just because you can record it 10 times you're gonna drive yourself crazy I said record it once or twice pick the best one and just <laughs> the same routine for three weeks now I'm done with it <laughs> All right, on that note, uh, it's 2.05. So people will join as we uh, get going. That's what they've been doing. Um, so, and then they'll catch on that they should mute themselves and all of that fun stuff. So um, I think everyone here knows this already, but uh, thank you to Dr. Lashbrook and Dr. Faze for being with us and talking to us today. And um, if you would like to look back on any part of this conversation, it is being recorded and it'll be on the Dance Theater and Arts Administration website. Um, with a picture of both of your smiling faces. So it's easy to find. Um, so you guys can um, introduce yourselves, give a little bit of background about, I mean, I think everyone here basically knows you, but in case somebody jumps in who doesn't, um, just who you are, what you do at Akron. Um, and then however you guys wanna jump into the questions that I sent you, or I can ask them as we go so that we stay on track with each other, however you wanna do it. Um, Sounds good. So, uh, you guys. Dr. Lashbrook, go ahead. All right. Um, well, I am Lori Lashbrook. I'm chair of the voice area at the University of Akron. Uh, and I teach voice lessons, um, vocal ped this semester, and diction. And for many of you, I was involved with the Cinderella last semester and have been at the university a long time, over 20 years. So I've been a long time, but I've enjoyed it. So Dr. Faze. Uh, I'm Dr. Faze. Uh, currently, my chief position is to serve as principal of the uh, integrated uh, school district homeschool of the phase house uh, it's very exciting with my three and six year old um and no one's really been sent to the principal's office of late so we've we've corrected some behaviors of late and we're on a good path um at the university of akron i um, the assistant director of bands um teach some of the concert ensembles teach conducting and courses in music education and the marching band and the basketball pep band as well so so have you had any substitutes come in and teach for you <laughs> actually actually i was kind of a substitute today uh, i decided to give the uh the lead teacher mrs phase a break and uh i came in and we did a, a rousing lesson kind of had a cinco de mayo theme for the week with some Mexican and Spanish culture. So today we learned the Spanish alphabet. Oh, wow. And we uh, went and collected a few of our favorite toys and looked up how to say them in Spanish. And then we got to say, you know, me gusta orso and I love my bear and that kind of stuff. And, and then we did some flamenco dancing, which was very exciting, complete with instruments and ruffly uh, dresses. Although I didn't participate in the dresses, I was the band. I was going to, okay. Yeah. So, Amy, why don't you ask the questions, if you would, please? Yeah, however you want to do it. Yeah. Um, so, the first one that I sent you guys just to jumpstart some conversation was how have you as an artist and or a teacher exercised your craft, whether it being teaching or making music or anything in the spectrum of that, during a time where practice rooms and offices aren't a given? Go ahead, Andy. Okay. Um, this one actually was, has been particularly challenging for me. Um, you know, my primary instrument is the trumpet, uh, which I played all through grad school and both masters and doctorate degrees. Um, but when I kind of transitioned into college band directing, you know, the baton kind of became my primary instrument. Um, so it's been a little challenging over the last seven weeks, not having an ensemble to get up in front of and students to make music with. Um, it didn't really occur to me until about the end of the third week uh, how much of a problem this was when I realized I wasn't really listening to music or engaging musically 
uh, much at all, other than a few sporadic kids songs, you know, and things like that. Uh, since that time, though, I reached out to a few of my uh, colleagues in the band world, um, other friends that are band directors in different universities, and we've actually been getting together once a week and um, doing uh, over Zoom kind of like composer and piece of music wind literature jam sessions of sorts, where we kind of give each other homework and a composer to go check out listen to the music, uh, kind of develop some opinions about the pieces and come back and discuss. It's almost like our own uh, mini book club in a way. And that that's really kind of scratched the itch for me to stay engaged in expanding my musical knowledge and still uh, trying to reach out musically and perform or at least get in that sensibility a little bit. Um, I do think one of the biggest mistakes I made was I actually left my trumpet in the office mm -hmm. when I left Gazetta. Um, and uh, I, I think here, once the semester ends, I'm definitely going to sneak back up there and grab my trumpet one of these days and uh, give it a good bath and, and knock some of the rust off of it here at home. So that'll be fun. Well, um, I have been teaching voice online and two academic classes. Um, and I am, I am older, so there has been less performing um, for me at this point in time. Um, so mine has been the art of teaching. Uh, and it has been an adjustment to get used to the quality of sound on um, on on zoom and in that the delayed responses um when when we were told that we were going online and being at home i thought oh well, how am i going to do this um I, it has to be exactly as teaching was when we were in the studio together and i spent a lot of time researching platforms and i found this great app um this great platform um which uh, was just developed for online teaching. But there were so many problems with putting it together that eventually I turned to Zoom to use, to use that for teaching. It seemed the most practical for the time constraints. Um, I moved my studio home, five suitcases of books. So um, that was probably the most difficult element after um, deciding what platform to teach with. Um, and at the end of these weeks, I have found that my teaching has improved through this process. Now, my students may not believe that, but there's something about sitting in front of the screen and seeing the students where before I was in the office, you know, I would play the piano, I would watch them at the side, but my whole attention was on them and to have their their faces right there to see exactly what they were doing, um, every every articulation, um, and and to rely on them to do the warming up, to rely on the them to have the keyboard there. Um, it freed me up a lot so that I was listening with a new um, new set of ears. Um, and the other important element that I discovered during this time was community and I miss that community greatly that sense of students stopping in saying hello um, I, I can think of you know how many times have we said through the semester oh I can't wait till this semester is over um, but this semester it's been I've been really sad about this semester being over because of this time with the students to meet them at this time when um, with you know, it's 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 a different set of of um, of goals that they may have. It's a different outlook. You know, you're you're dealing with them, um, not just their musical growth, but just how they're dealing with all of what is going on. And um, I miss that bond. Although there is still a chance to have that through through the Zoom and the WebEx. Um, and to learn to be really, really creative in, in how you approach your classes. Um, I am not a tech savvy person, but I have learned to do so many things that I find exciting 
in my classes and teaching classes that are traditionally in person classes and with students that didn't take many online classes prior to this. It's um, it's been it's been a growing uh, time, but um, I am surprised how successful teaching voice lessons online has been. Um, we'll we'll find out when I hear all their juries. <laughs> <laughs> but I do miss the creative element of being in person and that that response. But as as Dr. Faye said, there has been a lot of uh, working with people throughout the nation, the world who give lessons, who are trying to adjust to this and not being alone has really um, helped a lot. I did at the beginning during my intro, I did forget to say, um, if you have questions during the talk, please feel free to drop them in the group chat um, and I'll make sure to read them out loud. We'll get to all of them. Um, if you have questions at the end that you want to ask out loud, we'll have time for that too. But if you're afraid of forgetting your questions, like I always do, just drop them in the group chat. We'll read them out loud. Um, I did forget to say that. But um, so my next point that I wanted you guys to talk about was um, the things that have served as motivators since the stay at home order orders were put in place. What has motivated you guys um, to either continue to teach well or to, uh, I don't know, get over not having your trumpet at home, but stay in that performance headspace? What has been the greatest motivator? Yeah, I think um, I thought this challenge, this question when I saw it uh, was was kind of interesting to kind of look back on my motivations over the past few weeks. And it, it, re it resulted in a pretty, I think, frank and honest assessment of uh, let's just say the roller coaster that I believe all of us have kind of gone through. And I think it's important to acknowledge th that roller coaster in the sense that when the stay at home orders, I know first came into place, I think everyone, um, you know, immediately it's, it's only human nature for us to look inward first to look at how things are impacting, you know, kind of the me, myself and I aspect of stuff. I know as a parent, you know, um, you know, my, my fears and hopes and everything came kind of all tumbling together for my children. You know, there was there was actually a moment or two when Akron, University of Akron was kind of shut down, yet my daughter was still going to elementary school for like another day or two. And those days were particularly challenging. My wife is an elementary teacher as well. So she was obviously still teaching. And so there were some moments where, you know, there were some real kind of gut checks of sorts, you know, in the educational psychology world, we talk a lot about um, uh, Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs. If you're not familiar with that, you can Google it. Um, but uh, basically at its base level are these issues of safety, issues of um, food, nourishment, uh, cleanliness, all that kind of stuff. And as silly as it sounds, we've all kind of Kind of, I think over the last couple of weeks, gone up and down the ladder on Maslow's hierarchy. Um, from the moment where we all realized we couldn't get our own haircut, um, you know, all the way to the oh my gosh, they're out of toilet paper at the grocery store, and I desperately need it because there's three women in my house. Uh, to you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, I can't remember the last time I had a, a complete buzz cut, but I did it to myself standing in the bathtub a couple of weeks ago. You know, it's things like that that you don't really think of or imagine that you'll have to deal with because of what our lives have, have been through normally. All that to say that there was a moment, you know, I, I talked a little bit about the moment about music making, but I continue to have moments where I, I have these brief realizations that, you know, either I'm lacking motivation or um, motivation is just hard to come by. And I know we've all been kind of slaves to our news feeds and our social media apps and all that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm right there with you guys on that. Um, but I think there was a gut check moment for me when I started to really begin taking inventory of what I'm consuming. And that's probably been my motivation, I think, for personal betterment. Um, that has yielded the highest results is just the fact that I'm trying to be aware of what I'm consuming 
in terms of the media I read, in terms of who I'm investing my time into, um, students or otherwise, um, other professionals, um, there's a lot of time drains right now. There's a lot of opportunities for you to kind of fall down a rabbit hole and potentially not come out for a long time. Um, I know when I was younger, um, I was more than capable of turning on a good role playing game on PlayStation or Xbox and just <laughs> falling into a cave for about a week and coming out only to use the bathroom and and get more cheese out of the fridge or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, so it's it's one of those things where I think motivation is something that you have to seek out. Um, and and I, I choose to do that by monitoring what I consume and making sure that I consume some positive things. Um, there's little things I follow on Facebook or Twitter or whatever that I look to for some of those motivational moments. Um, there's also, um, you know, just the reality that I think as humans, we're more motivated to achieve things that are tangible and actually achievable. So making sure that the goals you're setting for yourself are not too big, you know, a goal of, you know, something like I want to lose 50 pounds. It's a terrible goal to set for yourself. Set a goal that says something like, I want to make sure I go outside and I walk for 20 minutes each day. And even each day might be tricky, depending on where you are in your lifestyle. Maybe you just want to try to do it on Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. Whatever, but but truly create tangible, achievable goals that you can reach towards, and and don't be afraid to celebrate the successes when you have them, and also acknowledge that failures are bound to happen, and there's no shame in that. You've got to kind of get past the "I should have" dot 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 uh, kind of viewpoint, and I was stuck in there for a little bit too in the in the recent weeks. Um, but I, I feel like I've come through it now. Um, I can tell you that one of the things that does motivate me currently is the simple joy of my children. Um, they don't know what day of the week it is unless we sing the day of the week song, and neither do I. And to them, it doesn't matter. Um, if the sun's out or if it's raining, it doesn't matter. If it's raining, they wanna go jump in puddles with their boots, you know? Um, if the sun's out, they wanna go on a swing set. Uh, the simple act of pushing my kid on a swing for a little bit is filled with so much joy right now. And it's probably a joy that I would have overlooked eight to nine weeks ago in the hustle and bustle of everything. Would have been, no, 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 go swing yourself. Have your sister push you. You know, that kind of stuff. And now I'm like, no, I got this. I'll, I'll push you for five minutes. I can do that. So, you know, seeking out what you consume and and actively working towards your motivations i think is important you can't just wait for things to come to you you got to seek them out i think that's really crucial doctor what you got all right well i would say um i know it sounds kind of corny but um that the students and uh, my art and the need for the human experience has motivated me um I am much older. I have no children at home right now. Um, and, and as being older, I've experienced a lot in my lifetime, a lot of moments of maybe not as, as like the um, COVID-19, but um, different elements of the, the death of my son and my, my uh, husband having a stroke. And that, I think, um, don't get through them, you um, you move, you know, it makes things different. Life is different. And this has made life different. And, and my students, being there for my students and my love of teaching and of music, that has motivated me to come every day and to greet them and and to see how that they are, they are doing. And the um, it has encouraged me to learn to learn in new ways to be creative and um, to not look at this as the traditional environment. Um, I think that sometimes if we look back on, I look back at some of our faculty meetings and I think of how we talk about what 
what we need to do, what, what is music in this, um, in this time. And this is before the COVID-19. And, you know, we were constantly struggling with, well, traditionally we've been this and we've done this and we've done this. And I think that now we have to um, be motivated to be, um, to look beyond the traditional environment and that teaching is more than the subject matter and that it's, it's, it's the person and it's the gifts that those people have and it's to bring out those gifts. And I thought of throughout history, I've, you know, I've, I've, um, music, I love music history. There's especially, I love the national, the, the, um, when all of the national schools came, um, became, and, and we had the Czech, the rise of Czech music and Russian music and so forth. And I think of that period and I think of historically what has happened during those times, wars and poverty and so forth. And it was always the music and the drama and the poetry and the dance um, that have been the link to bringing people together and to call for changes in justice and truth and, and for humanity. And, um, and I believe even though we're not together at this point in time, creating that art, we are going to be an extremely um, important to, um, to bringing the world kicking and, and screaming into this new, this new life that, that we have to, to build. Um, and it's, it's not what we can't do, it's, it's what we can do. And that's what motivates me. I, I have to remember that every day. And I am thankful that I still have a job. And I am thankful that I still have that paycheck. And I am thankful that there are students who want to learn. And that's what, what motivates me. Um, and the fact that, that music and dance and art have been so integral to everything that happens in this world. And sometimes it's hidden and sometimes it's taken for granted, but it's not going to be um, because we will find a way to move it forward, to work through all of these constraints that have been placed upon us. That transitions really nicely into the next point. Um, in what ways do you see uh, the field of music changing because this time and what can up and coming professional musicians and teachers and administrators do to prepare for those changes? Um, you know, Dr. Lashbrook and I were talking a little bit about this before the session started. Uh, there is a great deal of uncertainty, um, I think, in terms of how our art forms will occur in at least the immediate future of the next year or so. And I'm basically referencing more or less until we have a vaccine of some kind, um, or at least uh, some form of testing that provides safety and security uh, for performers and audience members alike. Um, the issue that we have as musicians um, and dancers um, and audience members is obviously one of social distancing and one of the movement of airstreams through instruments, megaphones, whatever. Um, I mean, there was a horrible story out of, I think, California in the second or third week of everyone's shutdowns of a, a, a choir that chose to rehearse. And um, people contracted the disease and, and people passed away, unfortunately. Um, obviously, no one wants those uh, things to happen. But there is a reality to the current state of what we're dealing with. Um, in my art form, in the marching arts, you know, there's all sorts of kind of punchline jokes about, you know, socially distanced marching bands and, you know, how it would be perfectly fine for our 260 member marching band to socially distance in the, the visiting seats of our stadium, because then the entire stadium would actually be full. They'd all be six feet apart instead of squeezed into a can of sardines in one little section. Um, and, you know, there's also the, you know, kind of the running jokes of, okay, how do you make an A on the field and march it down the field six feet apart? 
you know, some people joked around and be like, hey, you could have the marching band wear masks and just put a little slit in there for the mouthpiece. And it's like, okay, that, uh, that totally defeats the purpose of a mask. But um, all that to say, I, I think once we get through this interim time period, you know, the arts are going to be what the arts always have been, uh, which is uh, a grounding part of our society. Um, something that people turn to if, for means of expression, uh, something that people turn turn to uh, during good times and in bad. Um, and I, I look for that to continue. Now, I do believe that we are in for a challenging, let's say, next three to five years. Um, just the realist in me looks at, you know, our state just announced yesterday uh, $300 million in budget cuts to public education. There are going to be some communities that pick up that slack um, in levies and things, those communities that are able, and there'll be communities that won't. And we all know that the arts are often on the chopping block. So I think there is a financial reality to where we are. I'm not trying to be doom and gloom with all of you, but I do think it's important that you at least are aware of the um, the depth of the crisis that's at our hands. A lot of people have been out of work for a substantial amount of time. That may continue. That's going to impact everything from college enrollment, families being able to send their kids to school, um, all the way down the line to pay to play activities. Can Johnny afford to rent a trumpet in the fifth grade band, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a lot there to unpack. Um, but I think art survives. I mean, that art has seen us through so many things over the years. Um, much like uh, Dr. Lashbrook was saying a moment ago, art is inspirational, art is necessary, art is a part of who we are. I'm, there's not a person in on this call today that probably wouldn't advocate for art and music and dance and theater to be uh, essential parts of a child's education. I think we're all there, though the unfortunate reality is that our society may not be there. So it's just balancing those two ideas, finding mean meaningful ways to make art and make music, to share that music and art, um, and to advocate. I mean, music advocacy and art advocacy is something that um, is going to need um, it's going to need invigorated in these in these coming years, and we're going to have to fight even harder, not only for our positions, but for our students whom we know have desperate need of our art forms. I look forward to those battles because I think as long as I can get in the room with the people that need to hear what I have to say, um, that I think I I have a way of making those those uh, those points understood and those points heard. What I think is valuable for all of you, and I actually am stealing this from another Zoom meeting that I was in on last week, um, where a kind of a giant in the college band profession said it very eloquently. If you don't force yourself into the dining room to sit at the table when the discussions are being had, you're likely to find yourself on the menu. And that's you know terrible, but it's also thought provoking in that if you're unwilling to act in advocacy and in support and to create content and share content and not just digitally, but, you know, over the next year or two or three to make your art, whatever it is as an educator, uh, to make it heard and seen and felt um, and to, to truly try to have an artistic aesthetic impact on people, um, then we will fall by the wayside. I'm confident that we as artists will rise to those challenges, but they're going to be new challenges, uh, challenges that maybe we're not used to fighting so hard for of late. So yeah, I look, I welcome those challenges because I really truly believe we will rise to them. But I do think there's, it's a very important task that we have to, to make those challenges, make us as artists aware of those challenges is what I'm trying to say. So that we can meet them head on and we can tackle them and we can stand up for our art forms. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the practical um, legal things that we have to um, take into consideration now. Things like um, the space being large enough, if at all we do get back to teaching, um, that that are uh, that when we're looking at um, locations for concerts and so forth, we have to think about how large is the room, um, how high is the ceiling. Um, you have to talk about insurance elements. Uh, I saw a report that discussed that we will never be at 0% of COVID-19. It will never be gone. That we will always have to live with some element of this. So that means, you know, the ideal world might be the 3 to 5% chance of this continuing. Um, the ideal world, we will have testing all the time. The ideal world, we will, um, we can take temperatures and, and people will be open to, you know, these limitations and, and we'll be, you know, everyone has to, everyone has to take this seriously, or we won't be able to, um, we will never be able to be back to normal, as they say, a new normal. Um, but we need to think about things um, if you're going to go back into teaching and if you're going to teach into your home and you have that, you know, they said you can go outside and you could teach um, because of the air, but you have to have the air circulating. You have to take into consideration all of those elements and the legal ramifications that um, I'm sure the university is looking at, you know, how can, how can everyone be safe when in, the, in this? So I think our arts, are going to change in that regard with how large of buildings we're going to have. How how many people are we going to crowd together? Um, the other element I saw that people they had a little graph of what they took a, a study of how many people attended zoo went to zoos or concerts or you know how many how are they going to continue this? And there was thirty six percent attended arts and concerts. And will they do it in the future? And thirty five percent said, yes, they will. So that was hopeful. I mean, the the greater um, more people were, you know, I will go to a, an outside. I will go to the zoo where I will go outside to a festival, you know, because people are feeling safer in that realm. Um, but but there's so many things that we we have to um, we have to reconsider um, the, you know, um, the spaces in which we teach, um, the air circulation where we teach. Um, you know, we have a lot of old buildings, so that so those things are going to be a part of it. But then, instead of being discouraged, I think that you, as young artists, and um, and me, as someone coming to the closer to retirement. You need to start thinking about virtual shows. Can I put together something? Can I put together something that can be sent to a school that they can, instead of having those artists come into the school, can I put together some kind of um, virtual working with children on um, role playing? Or can I put together dance steps, something that's, that's more virtual, Facebook shows? Um, putting, you know, the, we, when I was, um, arts programs used to go into the schools. Now develop something, build something that you can be this one man show, one woman show, that you can start to be creative in, in, in putting things together in, a, in the virtual world that you don't have to be there in person. Um, I think, I think of the, one of the first things in it all the people going out on the balconies and playing music and singing together. Um, you know, we can still do that. You can, um, we can do it outside, um, but not to put your head in the sand and say, oh, we can't do it like we did before. Come up with what is it that I love about my art? What is it I love about my teaching? What can I offer to someone? Can I offer tips on Facebook about how to help a young student practice? Can I help tips on Facebook how to um, 
you know, working on different dance moves. These are the things that I had difficulty when I was in preparing for college. Tips to help them. Um, a a absolutely anything. Um, how to develop your roles, how to um, learn the roles. Um, just anything to help people in your field of the arts become better at their craft. And I think, you know, we, we first, some of us sit back, I did this and I thought, oh, I'm not, I'm not good enough to do that. But don't wait, don't allow the fear of, of, of failure or not being successful to stop you from, from choosing to try something. Um, because it's those times when, when we were maybe turned in another direction that some of the greatest things happen and um, not to be afraid to ask and not to be afraid to be creative and, and put some things together. I think the most difficult element of this will be the, the legal ramifications and to be on top of all of those things to make sure that everyone is safe um, and to, to be human in all of this because it's hard. You know, we, we don't all agree on what our legal rights are, but we need we need to work together and we all need to be on on that team and be able to um, to work to 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 have the testing and to have to come up with um, ideas to m move everyone forward and we will never be the same but we can be better and um I think of the canal in Venice, how you can see the bottom of the canal be, and you never could before, you know, that is amazing to see things that you can see less um, carbon um, in the, from the space and so forth. So hopefully we can, we can each be creative in coming up with um, ideas to move our art forward and to try different things. Yes, that's what I have. But yes, to fight, to not sit quietly. I'm going to jump to a couple of questions that I had just while you guys were talking, and then we'll hit the last one. Um, what are some of the best tools that you've come across as teachers um, in order to give your students the best learning experience while you're teaching online? I've used Marco Polo. <laughs> And I know this is probably an old lady's app, but I have my students um, email me or Marco Polo me um, an excerpt of their singing or their warm ups, and then I can respond to them. So it's like just a little checkup to know that they're they're practicing. Um, so I've used that. Um, I've used the internet much more than ever before, um, and um, I think I am so thankful that I taught to rock online because <laughs> it was not as difficult for me to put things together and put it on there. In fact, I was more familiar with Brightspace and teaching online and modules and so forth than my students, some of my students were. Um, but I have found all those little tools, Marco Polo. Um, I also started um, a Facebook vocal ped section, private section. And so then I had discussion points there and I had them do posture with a family member or different things that they had to load up and talk about. But the, the Marco Polo was so fun. It was, it excited me so, so much to have the students send me there and then I got to talk with them and, and tell them, you know, this was great to work on this, just little inspirational moments. I'm gonna have to check out that Marco Polo app. I've never heard of it before, so. <laughs> New one for me, so that you got me trumped there. So you got to stop calling yourself the uh, near retirement professor in the room. <laughs> <laughs> sounds to me like you got a new career ahead of yourself. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, funny I, about your question, Amy, uh, in terms of technology and whatnot, you know, I do consider myself, you know, as fluent as an almost 40 year old person is in technology. 
um, and that I've grown up with it and I know how to use it and have stayed updated on everything. Um, but I think I fell into a little bit of the trap when things shifted online. In the spring, I teach two uh, lecture slash laboratory classes, uh, basic conducting class and um, a marching band techniques class for the instrumental music ed majors. And the marching band techniques class is pretty project based. So that was honestly not all that challenging to put up online. Um, what I did find really challenging is I, as a communicator in lecture environments, you know, I thrive off of the kind of nonverbal cues, the student feedback, the, the understanding that you potentially receive from students when you see that glimmer in the eye, you see the thought, the light bulb go off above the head and then they go, hmm, and they write something down. Um, or even just the mannerisms where you can understand that, you know, I don't, I don't know that Lauren got that, so I'm gonna go over it again. You lose some of that connectivity through these online platforms. Um, and the first week or two, I really struggled with how to kind of bridge that gap to make sure student understanding was still occurring. Um, and, I, you know, I came up with a very non-technological solution and it, and it seems really stupid almost, but I, I realized that, you know, where I was going wrong was that I wasn't involving the students as much as I used to. I was... I was so bent on here's the, you know, X, Y, and Z that we must learn today. I'm going to present that info, get in and get out, be clean and simple with it and let them just consume it in their own way at their own time, you know, be it I post a video of that information or a lecture or whatever. And um, just the simple act of um, asking more open-ended questions, getting students talking, you know, that's the one thing I would say about even a session like this thus far. I'm happy that we have the attendance that we have, but I'm sad that I haven't heard from any um, anyone other than Amy asking questions up to this point. You know, I, I sincerely would hope that all of you have some questions in your head or have had some thoughts in your head at some point in time during these, this session and all the sessions you've been attending. And my, my question would be is to all of you is, have you felt like an active participant in your learning? And somewhat rhetorically, as you answer that is, if the answer is no, I don't feel like an active participant in my learning, then the solution to that is as teachers and as students, we need to find ways to better communicate so that we can be active. Whether that's Marco Polo, whether that's, you know, a, a different format for our Zoom meetings and discussions, whether that's coming to Zoom sessions prepared with the content previously administered so that these truly are idea sharing sessions and that we consume content differently. And we're not just getting it direct from teacher. Maybe we're getting it from a video or a resource or something like that. And then these class meeting times are really not for you to be lectured to, but for you to share your ideas and for you to present your questions. And I, I think that kind of consideration um, results in more active learning and thus more understanding. I kind of found that out about two weeks or so into it and started to make those transitions. And I think the students in my class has really responded positively to that. Um, and I, I hope uh, similar experiences occur, occurred for all of you. Uh, but if not, know that we're all learning and trying and figuring this out as we go. Um, my parents, who are not teachers and are not musicians in any way, shape, or form, asked me after the first week of class, how are your classes going online? And I said, Mom and Dad, to be honest, it sucks. I'm, I'm currently right now being asked to do a job that I did not sign up to do. No point in time during my collegiate preparatory career that I ever go, man, I want to teach online band. <laughs> I, want to, I want to teach future teachers, but I want to do it through a computer. That is my number one goal in life. 
no, nobody has said that. Just like none of you signed up for an online education. Otherwise, you would have went to University of Phoenix or Southern New Hampshire or whatever, <laughs> right? That's not to knock those places because there are people that need those services. But all that to say that we're all in this together. We're all trying to figure it out together. So not only do professors need to make changes, students need to be prepared. Should we continue in an online platform into the fall? Um, which I have no idea if that's going to happen or not. Um, I think we all need to be prepared to be a little more active and, and contribute more to our learning going forward. I think that's the, um, that's one of the things about the online. Um, I have taught my diction class for, I don't know, 20 years, you know, PED a number of years now. My PED class did change this year because we included um, choral techniques with it. So it was a com combination of two classes. And I found that I did much more preparation for each class and I did much more um, putting things up and sending things out after and finding ways to in encourage students to talk. So there was much more, there's much, much more work in preparing an online class to get your students involved and find ways for them to be involved. But the one thing that I never mastered in all of this is that those of you that know me is that I kind of move around a lot and get excited and so forth. And so I was never, sometimes my head would be right in your face at your lesson because I'd get so excited and I'd lean forward and I thought all of those things that they said at the WebEx session about make sure that you're not dressed too wild in colors and make sure you're not in your kitchen and make sure you're not all these different things. And then I'm like, yes, and my face is in the, you know, and I'm, I'm really, I'm like, well, they know that's me. So that's what it is. And um, I wasn't going to just stand there and be straight. And, and it's, um, that's who I am. It's important though. You got to be you in this. You know what I mean? And that's, that's the unfortunate reality of this type of learning and teaching is that we feel like we lose some element of connection of to who we are as individuals because we can't contribute as individuals. Right. Feel more like a number going through a system. Um, and it feels that way for your teachers too. It, and it's important, I think, that we find connectivity, we find things to rally around and ways to communicate. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, via Facebook discussion groups or via Marco Polo or via even just a more congruent discussion um, in these types of sessions is really important. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Have more questions if no one else does. <laughs> um, how has teaching online changed how you'll go back to teaching in person when that finally happens? I think I will be more aware of the opportunities for resources mm -hmm. um, and just, you know, this is kind of a double edged sword because uh, Lauren's a member of my symphony band. So, I mean, there's a little bit with this. There are some concert cycles and other concert cycles where I use Brightspace more than others when I'm just as a band director. Um, sometimes I've been really good about posting videos or recordings or reference things. And interestingly, I've always followed the numbers on those. In other words, the number of times students actually click them. And uh, it's often disheartening to see the amount of effort that goes into posting resources and the, uh, the lack of their usage. Um, I, I don't know what this answer is, but man, I hope there's a way we can, we can take better ownership of our learning so that we're excited about additional resources. You know, there's like, there's a section on almost everybody's syllabi, you know, at the bottom that says, you know, not required texts or additional resources. And we all, I did it too, get to that point in the syllabus and we're like, whatever, I'll never look at that book, right? But I don't think the teacher would take the time to list those things, to post those things if they weren't of value. Um, so just kind of uh, wrapping your head around, what am I getting out of this education? What do I hope to get out of this education? 
even if it's a class that you think may not be 100% authentic to your future career, um, searching for what is potentially an opportunity. Um, and I think that's a huge thing in life when you're presented with challenges. Okay, what is this trying to teach me? This challenge that I'm being presented with, what is this failure trying to teach me right now? Um, what lesson can be learned? What lesson is the good Lord teaching me at this exact moment or whatever? Um, I, I think that's all really important for us to take inventory of. Well, I think I will um, use more bright space much more um, if if we are back into the classes. I think that um, I I have always strived to meet my students um, what, with um, if in the voice studio if they are a specific learner if they are kinesthetic or if they are visual I try to meet them where they're at and then bring them um, to other ways of learning and I think. Um, that I will not change and that I will continue. But I think um, with our current student body that they are, they are less book oriented and they are much more, I mean, I was, you go to the library when I was a student and you know, all of those elements, you read it and you study it and, and, and all of that. Um, but you're more online, let's check out online. And so I think, um, I included in my classes lots. I put filled my modules with with all kinds of things, um, especially in vocal pedagogy. I had um, different resources where you could watch the spectrogram with um, with with the voice, and you could see um, all the vowels and different pictures. Then the pink trombone, and I know that extra credit is not something. Um, that is supposed to be done in education, but I gave extra credit. I gave extra credit for looking at these videos and writing two or three sentences down of something because I wanted students to look at that. And so I'm gonna, um, and I did more projects, um, more, more hands-on, let's develop um, warm-ups and decide what these warm-ups, why we do these warm-ups and different things. So it's more applicable applicable to when they're out there teaching and um, putting things together instead of let's just have an exam where you can throw regurgitate everything that we we talked about. Um, I did decide that exams weren't that important at this time. I did have little quizzes and I did have worksheets and things that they had to do, but I wanted to get them into reading the book that they purchased by answering these questions. I wanted to do things that were not your traditional, okay, this is your exam and we have this final then. Um, or with lessons, doing, um, making sure that, that we have program notes and that we have things that draws them into what the whole purpose of, you know, taking the, the, the various classes. So, I'm going to continue to use Marco Polo and I'm going to um, put together Facebook pages for different classes. Um, I found that it, it students did did go in and, and, and look at these things. You know, I tried to encourage them to. I tried to put things in for each specific student that what they were after. I had master's students, you know, that were performance majors. I had master's students who were high school teachers to find things that would be of interest to them. And I'm gonna look at more of it. I may not be very good at it, but I'm gonna keep putting it in there. <laughs> Alana just sent me a message and she says she has a question. So. Hi, um, Dr. Lashbrook, this might be more geared toward you, but uh, you know, I'm a, applied lessons college teacher as well and i'm wondering how and i mean for all your students in general how have you gone about adjusting expectations or not adjusting expectations because i'm finding you know with all of this transition um it changed the workload of undergraduates a lot and it also changed about how we can address things as uh, music educators because our uh, profession is so practical based, you know, when you can't have ensembles and you can't hear everything with the sound quality. So have you back 
left off expectations, either of you, or have you just adjusted them into a different way? Or what kind of leniency have you found in uh, what have you found that works best so far for both you and the students now and in their future progression? Um, well, maybe um, Izzy can answer if, if this worked or not. At the very beginning, when um, as voice chair, I met with the fellow voice teachers and discussed with my colleagues. And I did not want, we discussed and came together that, but my, my goal in, my, in discussing with them was not to adjust the expectation of the quality that, of which we are asking, but to lessen the quantity of requirements. Now, we have, um, we have a, a promotional jury every, when the students are moving up from their freshman to their sophomore level. And I didn't want to make that less of a requirement because I feel that musical skill is really important and my colleagues agreed with that. Um, but that during the, that we will have that and, and we did put that off till the fall and we may have a problem and then have to do it online or, you know, have to do it six, seven feet apart or do all of this in Gazetta with two people far, you know, far apart. But so much of singing and, and the, the work with that pianist, that collaboration is, is lost when we have this recording. Uh, so much of making it art is lost in this. I've got to fit it into this. Uh, so we limited the number of songs that the students had to do for a jury. And um, where we would have had our freshmen prepare four pieces, they still have their four pieces, but they only have to upload one. And we still have them, um, we're doing the jury sheets just the same, and it's still the 20%. Um, we have them still do the program note. Um, but we want the quality um, in the lesson time and, and that we are trying to achieve this excellence. I also, we also thought that it was important during this time, all these classes moved from in-person to online. And a student cannot progress in their singing or in their instrumental playing if they don't pass the theory and if they don't pass the piano and if they don't um, move advance on their, their, their core courses. And I was, we felt it was important to give them some leeway there so that they work on those core courses and those are extremely important and we, we need to keep them singing and work on excellence in one or two or three pieces as opposed to feeling the stress of, I have to excel at everything. Um, so we still wanted them to love their art, love making music, and find it to be a release from those pressures. The only thing I would piggyback off of that and say, you know, with my lecture classes, especially, um, I think it's important to, you know, A, first of all, look at the learning goals and the syllabus and realize that it's your job as the educator to see that the students achieve those learning goals. So um, making sure and ensuring that, that the students are brought up to that level, I think is important. Um, I know with my lecture courses in the, in the effect that we cut out those weeks right before spring break, kind of had that extended break more or less, you know, that, that removed I think for most for my classes, three or four meeting days. Um, so I really had to look at the class and kind of trim the fat a little bit and say, okay, especially the marching band techniques class, because I already only have 30 class periods of less than an hour to tell instrumental music head majors how to go about running what'll be the largest and most time consuming part of their career for the next 30 years. And the one thing that the, the mass public will judge them the most on. And I lost four of those class periods. I mean, the first thing I did was cry a little bit. <laughs> and then I was kind of like, okay, 
let's let's figure out what the actual nuts and bolts are what do they actually need to survive and i actually sent the students a survey and had them rank the the different content areas because you know i'm not going to spend two class periods talking about color guard if everybody in the class already feels like they got a good handle on color guard because maybe they spun flag in high school or whatever you know so just i i asked the students I, and I, they found that really valuable, and then I was able to prioritize the learning a lot for them. So don't be afraid to truly meet the, the students exactly where they are with their experiences that they're bringing and adjust your curriculum accordingly. Great question. Amy, what else you got? I have one more. Um, how will this change the perception of the importance of society you both kind of already touched on this but in case you have had any epiphanies in the last 20 minutes i missed the it's, will you say it again Perfect, yeah. say it again how will this change the perception of the importance of music in society i think personally um it kind of goes back to my advocacy thing that i think we're in for a challenge um, I think it's an, a manageable and achievable challenge to advocate for who we are and what we do and what we bring to students. Um, I also think that, at least in the public school world, um, there's a whole lot of parents right now that are pulling their hair out, that want their children back in the schools desperately, in large part so they can themselves can go back to work. Um, but also, I think there's a lot of people right now that have a lot more admiration for teachers than they ever have had. Um, and I also think there's a great number of people that realize that because their child, I mean, I'm spending more time with my children right now in this current stat state than I have since they were infants and I was home and that kind of stuff. Um, I, I hesitate to say that I'm learning more about my children, um, but I'm certainly getting to know them better and I'm and I can certainly see some of the shortcomings. Now I have an elementary teacher in the house with me, so I am pretty gosh darn blessed in terms of the homeschool world. But I know just from talking to neighbors and things like that, they they're pulling their hair out because Johnny loves art class and isn't getting to draw pictures anymore. And Davy loves gym class and isn't getting to do basketball right now. So there's there's lots of things right now where they're they're realizing that the needs of their their children are not being met. Um, mama bears will fight forever for their kids when they realize that their kids have needs. Um, that's the beauty of mama bears. I love them to death. Um, so I mean I think there there's something to be said for parents realizing what we bring to the table as our educators. Yeah, I think that um, that from the beginning of time, music, art has been a part of our lives. And um, I don't think it will be easy. I think I think, you know, it's it's something that people think you know, we can put aside because we have all these other things to worry about. But I don't think you can silence it. And um, I think of all the little Facebook, YouTube, little blurbs that pop up of different family members getting up and singing or or different um, virtual choirs putting it all together. Um, I think it will take some discovery. It will take time and commitment. Um, I think it will evolve. I think we will grow and become an important part of the world. Um, it, it's been uh, studied how important music is to the growth and development of, of humanity and art and um, beauty that it's going to be there. Um, it just may not be as we've known, and it may be difficult to move through, but I believe as the communication has, has worked between all the various art, wor art worlds, groups um, in this world, 
um, getting together arts organizations and talking about what we need to do and how are we going to move forward. Um, I think there will be solutions and there will, there will be, um, it will continue. It just may not be as we have done it in the past. And I believe that those simple little songs and nursery games that we play with our children and our grandchildren, that's going to keep that music alive. And, um, you know, I think of all the little nursery rhymes that many of you don't even know that I grew up with. I think families are going to bring those back. And I think um, those little moments of, you know, bringing music to the world, um, will continue. I went to Haiti a number of years ago. My son, my brother has a mission there and um, my son was moved immensely by um, that poverty in that, that world. And so we went to Haiti to leave some of his ashes. And I thought, what can I do for these? You know, what can I, what can I bring? I don't know. I, I can't fix something. I don't know how to pound or build, but I brought up uh, about 60 um, recorders and I went to the schools in these little, this little village and I brought the recorders and they were bright colors and the children had the recorders and I worked with the children and the parents wanted recorders and I went back to the mission that night and I could hear hot cross buns being played throughout that whole beautiful poverty stricken community. And there will be music. It may not be metropolitan opera singers at this point, but there will be music and we may have to start over and build it, but music will be there. Art will be there, dance will be there. have one more question um, from Lauren, if you guys have time and are up for it. So Lauren, whenever you want to unmute yourself. Hello. Um, so my question, you guys kind of touched on this a little bit, but it's just kind of how are you both or how is anyone, if anyone wants to answer this, how, how are you dealing with the amount of uncertainty we're all feeling? And what do you recommend for students on how to deal with it? Because I've dealt with uncertainty in my college career, but this is a whole new level of like not even knowing what the fall is gonna be for even back. And I'm just, I'm struggling on figuring out how to manage that, so. I'll be honest, I haven't slept well the last few nights. Um, I think Dr. Faye said, get out and exercise, self-care. Um, Journal, journal. Um, you, we all have things that, you know, it's, it's easier when you're older. We all have things that it isn't really, but um, we've all been put on little detours throughout our life and, and open, be open to the possibilities of what those little detours can do and be kind to yourself and love yourself and um, ask for help when you need help. And you can reinvent yourself. You can, you can come up with, you are a very talented young woman and you can, you have all the possibilities there. It isn't gonna be easy, but I think of, um, Be kind to yourself and, and, and dream and write, write down things. That is the most important thing. I think keep notebooks, journals and write things and remember things and remember that, that, that st stupid thing. When one door closes, another door opens. It is true. And if you're feeling like your glass is half full, then find a smaller glass and pour that in and it's full. So, so each day, um, Put yourself with the people that make you feel um, like you can do this and ask for help when you need help. That's great. Um, 
You know, uh, a mentor of mine told me once um, that self care is not warm baths and ice cream and candles. It's creating the kind of life for yourself that doesn't need escape to warm baths and ice cream and candles. I love a good warm bath and I eat ice cream almost every day of the week. Um, all that to say that what Dr. Lashbrook said there at the end about the size of your cup, what doesn't change in that equation is the amount of water, right? What changes is the expectations you have for yourself, potentially your goals, the magnitude of them. And it doesn't mean you should not dream big and have great goals and aspirations, but you should live a little more in the now. And I think the way I wrap my hand around doing that, especially with the uncertainty of like the fall semester that we're all dealing with and the cuts that are going on at our university and um, many, many, many other things, I'm sure in your own personal lives and family lives, is just a little bit of taking an inventory of, okay, I have no control for many of those things. I would love to be in the room right now that's probably going on in Bookdale Hall or via Zoom or whatever where they're making these decisions. At the same time, I'm glad I'm not in that room. Um, I wish I had a voice in that room for all of us, um, but at the same time, I'm glad I don't. Uh, my security clearance isn't high enough and they don't pay me enough to make those kinds of decisions, to be honest. Um, that being said, I know just facts. Look at what is actually in front of you that is tangible that you can grab onto. Let's talk about University of Akron and reorganization and budget cuts for a quick second. There is a board of trustees meeting scheduled for June 10th. We're going to get little, little fabrics of information kind of spittering out between now and June 10th. The reality for all of us is there will be absolutely zero clarity on exactly what is going to happen until the Board of Trustees votes on June 10th. So you can read all the write-ups in the Beacon or the Plain Dealer you want. You can stay informed. You can watch the videos. You can read everything known to mankind. But that's probably going to only impact you negatively. And I'm not saying you shouldn't read those things and shouldn't stay informed. But what I'm saying is you should read those things and inform yourself with the understanding that what you're reading may or may not happen. And it is definitely outside of your sphere of control. At this point, right? Just that little realization of what is outside of my, my scope. Allows me to take a deep breath and say, okay, what is. Within my control. Well, one of the big things that's in my control is right now planning and moving forward with the options that I have in front of me, the tangible, factual things. It is possible, although I don't exactly know how yet, that there is a marching band season in the fall and we do play football in some way, shape or form. What that look like, looks like exactly, I don't know. But it is possible, and therefore I am planning for it. Hence why leadership auditions and twirling auditions and everything else are due next Friday. Okay. Um, there are many other plan B, C, D, and E things that I'm also planning for. One of which I don't think is really that far of a, a, a mind leap for those of you that are marching band folks. And that simply is that we may move forward with no preseason band camp because the university has canceled everything in August in terms of online and face to face stuff. And our camp falls right on that precipice. So, what does our band look like without a preseason camp? Well, that might be plan C, D, or whatever down the list. But I sit there and I sketch out some ideas. I write it down, like Dr. Lashbrook said, of what I could control in that scenario and what our band would look like when we perform. And what goals we would have, what music we would potentially play, the drill I would write, all that kind of stuff. So I'm basically taking the facts that are in front of me, 
going, okay, here's what I can control in there. Here's how I can plan in this one. Here's what I can do about that one now and doing what I can, taking tangible steps in all those areas, but doing it all with the understanding that none of it is etched in stone. Even though our university is gonna make their decisions on June 10th, the NCAA is likely to not make a decision about college football or college sports in general, probably until July 1 at the start of the fiscal year for the university. So there again, we may have a decision that's made on June 10th that says, hooray us, we're gonna have school and we're gonna have band and all this kind of stuff, but we still have another half a month before we figure out something. So again, taking that deep breath and realizing what's the tangible thing in front of me that I can achieve doesn't mean you don't stay informed. It doesn't mean you don't eat a bowl of ice cream. <laughs> it does mean that you, you look inward within your little bubble. You know, your bubble is quite physical right now for all of us because we're screaming to get out of our bubbles right now. So let's look in our bubble and see what we can do and what we can make better within our bubble. Maybe there's a relationship at home you can work on with mom and dad or brother and sister. Mm -hmm. I know there's landscaping in my backyard I can continue to work on. I know there's laundry to be done. I know that there's ice cream to be ate. And all those things will get done. And they may not get done today, and that's okay. But they will get done because they're within my control. So it's our job, I think, to continue to manage what we control, what we can control, manage it as best we can, uh, but with the understanding that we have to be kind to ourselves, like Dr. Lashbrook said, and realize that it's not all going to be done in a day, right? So build yourself up over time. Find the tangible thing you can check off today. Do it. Celebrate it with a bowl of ice cream. And then move on to the next thing, whatever it is. I've got, I've got a craving. I'm sorry. <laughs> Keeping Different. normal activities that you do doing the things that are normal, um, getting up each day, um, finding little projects, read a book that you haven't done. Um, maybe you're interested in, in writing a play. Uh, maybe you're, you know, do at least one thing and then that will keep you active. And that will, once you get going doing something, um, then you will move forward and find other things. So, as much as you can get up each morning and welcome the day and and um you know step forward still with your goals in mind and and making those goals let's not forget too that there's a lot of families and a lot of people that have been horribly negatively and irrevocably impacted from this virus um, and how blessed we are to have this day and this next opportunity. So do you have to, you know, do everything right here, right now, today? No, but we owe it to the people who don't have today to at least honor today and find that one thing that we can do well today and do it. And it might be a five minute thing. It might be a, a three hour landscaping job. Who knows? Okay, but <clears throat> you got to figure out what that thing is and try to tackle it, I think. I believe in a higher power. And when I struggle, I, that's, that's, I, I give it to my higher power. And whatever your higher power is, I think that's, that's important. Um, that, that, give it over. And, um, and be thankful every day that, um, that we do have a home and we do have our health. Dr. Faze is right. That's, um, we are lucky. We may not think so, but we are very fortunate. So I want to say thanks to Amy for putting this all together and, and Dr. Lashbrook, it was great to hear from you. And, to, and to visit with you, Dr. Faze. Um, so go be creative. Find something to be creative. I am so excited to see what Izzy will write and what Lauren will 
play and and Amy what you will uh, come up with. So find that because your creativity is a huge part of you. Thank you so much to both of you. Um, you know, I was very blessed to have both of you and I know this conversation is very encouraging to me. Um, it's been a rough week. So this was really good. Um, and I hope that both of you have a good summer. I hope that everyone else who tuned in um, has a really good summer. I hope it gets warm and feels like summer soon. Uh, <laughs> nice. uh, yeah, like I said before, um, this whole conversation has been recorded. So if you need to go back and listen to it or process more or just forgot what they said, um, you can go back and listen to it probably within the next, I don't know, 48-ish hours. Um, it'll be up on our website. Um, so again, thank you so much to both of you um, and have a wonderful summer to everyone. Thanks for having us and yes. be safe. And I miss all of you. <laughs> Absolutely. I miss you more. Bye. <laughs>